the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Okay, we got a young lady who's been, again, as I always indicate, a spark plug of our group, and she leads us through thick and thin, but we like to have her introduce herself and provide some information for the rest of the group. Go right ahead, please. My name is Kathy Sixel, and I live on County Trunk X going towards School Hill, and I want to welcome all the members of the Cleveland Fish and Game, and it's so nice that all of you came be on this, uh, the weather is not very well today, so uh, it's so nice. Um, we don't have very many rules. Uh, for one thing, if you want to speak, raise your hand so that Jerry can get over to you, otherwise it doesn't pick up on the camera. And always state full names, because if we use nicknames, a couple years down the line, we don't know who, has, who that was, that person was anymore. And please don't visit uh, when someone is speaking, because it picks up in the, uh, on the video or the DVD. So. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, who do you have here, please? Charlie Bauer, uh, Highway C, Newton. Okay, thank you. And who do you have here, please? Uh, Frederick Jacoby, Manitowoc. Thank you. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegand, Town of Centerville. Okay, thank you. Okay, got a gentleman here who'd like to introduce himself? Carl Ziegler, Cleveland. Thank you, Carl. And who do you have here, please? Marie Pippert, Cleveland. Thank you. Edith Litzy, Cleveland. Thank you. <coughs> and we have a gentleman here, please? Steve Holtzwert, Cleveland. Okay. But you won't, you won't find me if you ask for Steve around here. I'm Bing. <laughs> <laughs> you what again, please? My name is Bing. I'll Bing? Be yep, as far as fishing game is concerned. It's okay, very Bing good. Holzwer. Okay, very good. Thank you. And did you hold an office at all in this organization? Well, currently I'm the vice president of okay. the fishing game and okay. the caretaker. Very good. Thank you. And who do you hear, please? And Cheryl Holzworth, Cleveland, his wife. Okay, thank you. And who do you hear, please? Larry Klein, Cleveland, town of Centerville. Okay. I'm a fish and game member. Yes, sir. I did whole office here as president for 15 years and on both sides, trap and the organization. Okay, very good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Ricky Sohn, Centerville member. Okay, no offices at this point. No. Very good. And who do you have here, please? I'm uh, Cleet Wagner I'm from Cleveland, also a member of the Cleveland Fish and Game. I held president number of years back. Okay. I'm also board of directors of Cleveland Fish and Game. Okay, great. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? My own Klein, Larry Klein's wife, Cleveland. Okay, thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? Kay Schill, Glenn Beulah. Thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? Victor Schill, Glenn Beulah. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Uh, Dan Deere, Cleveland. Okay. I've been a member of the Fish and Game for 37 years, and I've held office of treasurer for 26. Wow, great, great, very good. And I guess then we'll go back to this young lady and she can ind indicate what we're up to today. Jerry, you forgot to introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> 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 My name is Jerry O'Neill, the videographer for the Greater Centerville Historians, and we're very happy to be here at this organization. They provided the premises and the the popcorn and other commodities, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I would like to start with thanking Larry, and I suppose I own had something to do with it too, maybe to help him and prod him with information. And uh, the members that came again on this snowy day, and with that, we'll start with Larry. Okay. Later on in the program, we're going to talk a little bit about the old Pytel store because Larry's son owns the Pytel store. Okay. Very okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, I have a gentleman here who is a, a leader of this group uh, quite a bit, and he'd like to start out with a, the, the story of the uh, Cleveland Fishing Game Group. Go right ahead, please. Yes. Back in 1942, June 15th, Mandawa County Fishing Game and Protect Association was organized here, and today it is called Cleveland Fishing Game. It was organized by all the people in the town here. Uh, they were uh, farmers, business people and regular just common people, workers, 
and they got together then and wanted to organize a sportsman club. So what happened back then was Harold Wimler, who owned Wimler's in Cleveland, was the original one. They called to order with all the members from the town. And uh, what happened was he was elected uh, temporary chairman and then uh, they moved on and uh, started the Cleveland Fishing Game. And they went on through and through and elected and officers and that. And uh, I've got all the details in writing here. So far up to date, I'm putting it all together. And uh, what they got together, they wanted to have a trap league, planting pheasants, trees for tomorrow. And the same thing what we're doing today. And uh, it goes way back. I've been talking to quite a few people already and, uh, and putting this together. Harold Drum was a temporary secretary at that meeting. And then they moved on through the years, through many, many presidents, vice president, secretary, treasurers. And uh, then they finally went together, held the meetings. The meetings were held at Wimler's Tavern. Okay. And then after a while, they moved it to Nenick's Tavern is where they held the meetings after that mm -hmm. until they appropriated some land and they built a trap house up here and I'm pretty sure it was constructed in, constructed in 1966. And then it kept on moving on and on and uh, what they did, they purchased land from Mr. Mrs. Zill, Mr. And Mrs. Zill at that A little uh, discussion pertaining to the people that uh, the land was purchased from and this gentleman will tell us all about it. Go right ahead please. Yes, the land that was purchased for the trap club, I'm up here at that time for the house, was from uh, Elvina Zell. Okay. And then they moved on and uh, still held the meetings in local taverns at that time. And then later on, they purchased some more land from Mrs. Zell again. Oh. Okay. And at that time, they were talking about building a clubhouse up here. And uh, that didn't take place until many, many years later. Uh, so at that time, still, like I said, the meetings were held at the bars. Okay. And what time do you know the year that this area was, or this clubhouse was built? The land, from what I can see right here, yeah, was purchased in 1967, two and a half acres, was bought from the Zills, with two signs put on the property, one on the property and one on the corner of County Trunk 149 and County Trunk Y, which what it was called at that time. And that was like from Mrs. Mrs. Bruno Zell. Okay. And the property was purchased was 2.44 acres at the cost of $742. The land and legal fees combined together. Okay, very good, very good. I'm going to go back to that road. I know out in front of us is that Range Line uh, uh, Union Road out there. It's Union Road now. Yes. It's Union Road now. Right. But at the time of at that, that time it was called County Trunk Y, according to the books. Okay. All right. And the present road that was known as 149 is XX now. Okay. And the road passing our property here right now is Union Road. All right. Very good. Thank you. You got anything there to continue? That'd be appreciated. Yeah, and through the years, there was a lot of work done. Back in 1967, Elray Yeager was logging out of woods. And he had the members come up if they want to get firewood on their own. He'd been donating that through all these years. And also corn for wildlife and habitat for the wildlife. El yeager has been donating it all these years, way back to 1967. Okay. Could you give the location? Okay, I got a gentleman here who will identify himself one more time, and he's going to read something of importance from the past. Go right ahead, please. Okay. As far as the clubhouse, could you, could you identify yourself? Yes, Larry Klein. Continuing Thank on. Thank you. As far as the clubhouse, the clubhouse was built back in 1969. 
It was a 25 by 36 foot for $1,000 or a 24 foot by 30 foot for $800. And they took the one for 24 foot by 30 foot and built it for $1,355. Wonderful. And uh, then after that, the outboard club that goes back in 1969 also was created in affiliation with, there were two separate clubs though, which was to promote the ramp down at Haika Bay down there. And they were trying to utilize monies. In that time, they raised 4,500 tickets were sold for that funding for the landing to try and put up, they were gonna put up a pier out there as a harbor. Presently, it did not come through yet. And uh, they do recognize us now on the map between Mandawak and Sheboygan that we have up here out here for safe, safe landing in case the weather gets too rough. And uh, that was promoted through John Tuzzi and John Kleckner was involved in that. I was involved in a few other ones trying to get this promoted so we can get a landing going down at Haika Bay. And today it is still utilized today which we turned it over to the village of Cleveland, of which we now take care of all the repairs, putting the pier in and out and maintaining whatever has to get done down there. Okay. And down the road in between there, they had built a pavilion, which I have a pictures of here, which was constructed. Okay. So just hold sure it there for what, a moment. What year that was, please, do you have any idea? Just hold it right there a moment. I've got it here someplace if I find it. Okay, and that's an open air type pavilion. It's got a roof and no sides at this point? So correct. It's just a shelter for the uh, a place to go when you hold events down there. All right. And, uh, and that place is now called what? Uh, where the pier and the pavilion are located? That is called Heike Park. Okay. And that pavilion, if I'm correct, was built in 1989. The project was headed by Bill Kalp, who is a carpenter, along with all the other volunteers of Fish and Game members who donated all their time to put this pavilion up. The stain was donated by Sheboygan Paint through the thanks of Wayne Herzog, who worked there at that at Sheboygan Paint. Okay. Okay. And, uh, Basically, as of now, uh, like I said, we, we still keep the place going with a project of all the members here volunteering their services. Okay, Cleveland Fish and Game, here's what I'm reading here now, okay. is giving the village of Cleveland to two piers as are. And this happened in 6-7 uh, of 1988, if I'm correct, if this I'm reading this document right here. And at that time, Peter Wagner was the president of Fish, Fish and Game. Okay. And then Wayne Johnson was the chairman of the Park Commi Commission Committee who uh, drafted this brochure up that was, was given to the village of Cleveland. Let's hold it. Okay, thank you. And also, getting back to the pavilion, I should have brought this in there before. I got some pictures here. It's okay. Goes back as far as uh, people down there helping uh, cleaning it, restoring it, and pre preser preserving it. I myself. Okay, can you show that picture? Yeah, this is. Okay. What yeah. they're doing here, they're scraping it down, getting it ready. To, we were going to, at that time, Restain it and reseal it, of which uh, Vern Gruby and myself, we had our time off, we went down there, and we sprayed uh, the stain and sealer on it okay. to preserve it. All right. Any dimensions that you can recall on that? Uh, as far as how big the building is? Yeah, just a rough ballpark. Type thing. I would say it's probably about 15 by 30. No. 30 by 50, excuse me. 30 by 50. Okay, good. Good, thank you. That's a pretty good 
And that was yeah. volunteered quite a bit. It was all volunteered, all donated time. The carpenter, Bill Cobb, at that time we offered to give him a donation. Uh, he says he'll donate it right back to the club. <laughs> Can't beat that. I'll no. Wonderful people. So. Okay, very good. Anything else you'd and like to Through the years, we kept on going. If we do build uh, bird houses, bluebird houses, wood duck houses, which we take and put out, you can picture that or not. Yep. They built them and they put those out in the, the wildlife habitat. Okay. Can you name any of the people that are on those pictures at this point? I'll let you take a look and see if you can come up with something. Uh, I see Tom Groupie, Larry yeah. Vandalo, Kevin Vandalo, Steve Scheidt, as I can make up right now that are on the picture that are playing that I can see. Okay, very good. Now these bluebird... Oh, excuse me, Larry Albright also is oh. in there, yeah. Larry Thank Albright you. was on there. Ray Miller, Hal Rummel were also of your helping these make these birdhouses. Okay. And uh, the these birdhouses get distributed in special locations or are they randomly placed anywhere? Whoever wanted them, needed them, whatever, they put them up in the areas where the business people or farmers would allow them to put in for wildlife habitat in areas where, you know, the ducks and uh, the birds Habitat areas are, they were put up at that time. Okay, good. good. Thank you. And then we, we go back to the Coho Derby. This was put up down there 25 years ago. Okay. Which was, uh, as of today, we're on a 27th Coho Derby, which was organized at that time by our club. It was put together by Ken Schnell, Chuck Herman. And they called me and Tom Groupie up yet, and we helped them put this unit together as of today it is still in existence today one of our big money makers of which we uh, take the monies and we uh, put them back into the public where we buy actually we buy uh, land and we turn it back over to public land wow I think we got over like 300 acres already I think we have purchased really which is all out there right now which is public hunting ground Fantastic. Like where is that, like this land, uh, Kathy? Had a young lady who had a question. Go right ahead, please. I wanted to know where this... Name, please. Kathy Sixel, and I wanted to know where this land was located that they donate back to for wild habitat. Okay, very good. Thank you. We got a gentleman here who a question was raised about uh, the uh, lands that they purchased and what they're doing with them. Go right ahead, please. All right, the lands that we purchased and we put back to the public for public hunting grounds are most of the property is down in the Cleveland Swamp they call it off of LS okay. heading towards Sheboygan okay. it's on the east side and west side of the tracks and then we also have some over here up on XX and other places in the county right now that any place we do find some land that's appropriate and uh, feasible for the prices right the county association and Cleveland Fishing Game here sometimes go hand in hand and purchase the properties together. Oh. And then it's, the taxes are paid by the association. And that is turned back to uh, the public, Wonderful. hunting grounds. Wonderful, great. Okay, anything else? Uh, I see something in the back wall there and you said you might be able to explain a little bit about it. Yes, we have a map over here of the area highlighted back there. Those are all the lands that are purchased that is down in the Cleveland swamp area, we call it. Okay. Off of LS, that is the land that is public hunting ground purchased through the Manual County Association and our, our organization here. Okay. Tell you what, I'm going to stop you at this point. I'm going to go over by that uh, okay. picture there and you can point out a few things for me, okay? Okay, I got a gentleman, Mr. Dine is here and he'll explain a little bit about the land that they purchased in both counties here. Right ahead, please. Larry Klein. Okay, this is Lakeshore Road heading towards Sheboygan from Cleveland. All right. And this is Manitowoc County up to this point right here. All right. All this property that is in here in the red was purchased to the associations and that is public hunting ground. This land was purchased lately. Okay. And this is in Sheboygan County. All right. And this is the railroad tracks going through the middle here. Okay. So you have the west side and you have the east side. Okay. Wow. And that land is, was owned by different... All prior, all, different all, private owners. Really? 
and some actually sold to us very reasonable, and uh, we purchased it and turned it to public hunting grounds. Okay, and right on immediately east is the shoreline of Lake Michigan, is that correct? Right, this is Lake Michigan right down here. Okay, very good. Uh, I'll do you one more thing. Give me uh, the north, <laughs> south, just to make sure I got my directions straight. Okay. Put your finger up this there. This will be north. Yep. South. East. Okay. West. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, I got a gentleman here who's been doing a great job, and he's got a lot of information at his disposal, but he's going to tell us a little bit about a, a unique thing that this club does. Go right ahead, please. Okay. Going back, who purchased the land? Why was the land purchased? It was the idea of the club members to go back, and I think it started back with Carlton Volk back in 1961, who was the president okay. of our club at that time, and all the presidents from then on followed through to purchase land, and then also to promote the, the landing down at Heike Park. Okay. And then through the years when the outboard uh, the Cleveland Derby started, the monies we arose from that, we were getting quite a bit of funding in our account, so we decided to purchase more land and more land, and just kept right on moving ever since. Wow. And as of today, yet we still are purchasing land, and we get involved with the Mandawa County's chapter association out of Mandawa, and they also are promoting this with us. So wonderful! It keeps going and going. So, and also other things that we do in the club is we sponsor kids to go to camp, uh, scholarships, things like that we do, and uh, trees for the morrow. And these are these are annual things we keep on doing every year because we we go out for prizes for the Derby. They ask us, what do we do with the club, with the monies in that? Mm -hmm. So we, we had a printout made that we give out when we go for a donation. Okay. And uh, we hand that to them. And so far we've been very welcome with it. And they turn over very nice prizes for our derby, okay. which is all donated. And we donate it all back to the people. We give the people a people's derby, which we do. And we are not out to make money on it. The money we do arise from it, we promote into purchasing land and help children for tomorrow and kids for camp and trees for tomorrow. Wow. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more question, and I hope I'm not overstepping anybody else who wanted to ask questions, but uh, this fishing derby, you said you uh, have some way of raising funds from that. What do you, do you charge somebody for fishing here in your derby, or how do you start the money rolling? We sell raffle tickets, okay. and uh, we have cash drawings off of them, and part of, part of the money funding comes back to our club, and then we charge a, a fish ticket, which they purchase the fish in our derby, just like any other derby, Sheboygan, Manawak, all over, you gotta pay a, a price to fish in the derby. That money is appropriate, you put it back in the funding, and the funds we make off of the raffles, and uh, the food, and the refreshments down there, that money goes back into our treasury, which we take after a while and promote this for the ideas and things we need that our club promotes. Wow, super, great job, thank you. We have a young lady who has a question, right ahead please. Kathy Sixel and I want to know when you talk about a public hunting land, is that land for the public or just for your members? Okay, I'll be right there. We have a question on the floor pertaining to the public land. Go right ahead, please. Yes, the public lands, the reason we cannot just say it's only for the members alone, because all these monies were appropriated by people from the outside through our derbies and that, and when we do purchase it, we just can't say it is ours only. Mm -hmm. It is turned back to the public. That means all the people. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman had raised his hand, I guess, and he has a question. Go right ahead. Yes, I got several questions. I'm going to kind of combine them all. My name is Charlie Bauer. I, I want to know what are the qualifications to join your organization? Is it just restricted to men or can women join? And approximately what is the annual cost to be a member? And approximately how many members do you have it now? <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. We got a gentleman here who has been presented some questions and he's in deep thought, but I know he's going to come through. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Dan Deere. Thank you. And uh, someone had asked what qualifications there are to be a member of our club. There is none. Okay. Uh, men as well as women could join the club. And our dues, I know back in 1960 was like $2. 
Okay. And then I got up to five uh, in the early 70s. And then uh, probably 10 years ago, it was 10, and now it's $20 to join the club. Okay. okay. And that's every year you renew every your... Every year renew it, yes. Oh, okay, thank and you. And there's 110 members right now in the club. Wow. And I have a list of members from 19, probably early or 1960s. Good. At that time, there was 115 members. Holy man, really? Mm. And have uh, you got some ones that are charter members at all or long time? Charter or? members? Um, Ray Miller, Ray Peanuts Miller was a charter member. Okay, and could you look, do you know his location where he might have lived or anything like that? Mm -hmm. It's not that important, but I thought if you had um, that. He lived um, out on Ellis. 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 Ellis, off Ellis, well, not to worry, on Ellis, just outside of Cleveland. Okay. Peter Wagner, who yeah. lived in Cleveland. All right. And now he's living up north. I can't think of any other charter members. I'm sure there are more, but okay. I can't think of any right offhand. Do you have a membership drive, if you will, that you go out and say, uh, shake hands and so forth and say, hey, we can have a lot of fun if you'd like to join us? Uh, not thing? really. Um, we had uh, in the village newsletter, Okay. we have uh, reports of what the Derby does and what we do with the money. Okay. And inviting people to come to our meetings every okay. month at seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. And there are new members that come every so often. Okay. We have actually more members that come to meetings now than we did probably five to ten years ago. We have usually a membership of twenty-five or more okay. come to the meetings, which is very good. Okay, very good. Yes, I would think. Anything else you'd like to share with us on this point with the books that are in front of you? Oh, I just have names of your. You want to know a lot of members that. We're back in the 60s have passed away. But let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Members from 1967. Henry Schwinn, Willis Voss, Clarence Culp, Peter Wagner, Thomas Wagner, Jerry Wehmeyer, Clarence Rupi, Ron Yost, Edward Zill, Ronald Huntsman, Lloyd Vogel, Gordon Pippert, Francis Vandaloo, Stanley Dine, Ray Bushman, Francis Pippert, Gerald Colshin, Jerry Stolzman, Donald Dine, Elroy Yeager, Alan Raisler, Ronnie Reichwald, Wayne Sixel, Bill Wagner, Myron Sullen, Ronnie Koenig, Donald Bennon, Ralph Wagner, Art Shuri, James Brust, John Kleckner, Ray Voss, Robert Herman, Eugene Stege, Earl Ulrich, Edward Koenig, Edmund Schmidt, Joe Scheidt, Bernie Rupi, Keith Henley, Florence Kress, Reverend Jerome Watney, Watry, Eugene Dossler, Roger Newton, Roger Yost, Harold Kolb, Albert Jacoby, Gerald Dine, Clarence Schwinn, Richard Vogel, Fred Kasperger, James Kern, Tom Yost, Hilbert Wagner, Robert Wagner, John Wolpiger, Melvin Kress, Roger Yost, Dennis Ulrich, Charles Koenig, Wayne Vogel, Jim Russo, Vern Yeager, Don Sharnan, Carlton Vogt, Art Leonard, Roger Voss, Norman Brust, Henry Cody, Edward Dersch, Francis Schneider, Larry Summers, Edward Kleckner, Gerald Koenig, Roland Fleischner, Polly Albright, William Menick, Peter Yankunis, Eugene Hintz, Bernie Kress, Wally Pippert, Dick Hepke, Wally Hansen, Paul Jacoby, William Rutherford, Jerry Feisner, Orville Meyer, Alden Weigert, Richard Kutz, Daniel Siebert, Tom Fiddler, Vernon Kress, Alvin Grotegut, Robert Tilke, Ellsworth Schutte, Larry Van Lu, Fritz Hemp, Carl Schneider, Harvey Hendricks, Arthur Sohn, Helmuth Gross Grossenbach, Henry Seaman, Wayne Shaw, Nick Reed, James Madison, Orville Karstedt, Silver Sylvester Leonard, 
Harold Bernard, Ken Schwartz, Wilfred Rafel, Bill Wandry, Robert Schneider, Robert Siebel, Paul Ertl, and Eugene Weber. Oh, thank you. Well done. Good job. A lot of names that come to mind. When oh, that. yeah. Very good. Thank you. Oh, one more thing shows up. I notice there's all men. Does that have, has that changed at this point? Uh, yes. There are uh, a few women that shoot trap. A few women that shoot, shoot trap. I think there's actually one team of women that shoot trap, if I remember right. Do you have any names of those women? Uh, I don't have them right offhand, though. No. Okay. Okay. My own's right here. Is she here? Mm -hmm. Okay, just one minute. Hey, Mr. Bauer, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself and indicate yes. a question. Charlie Bauer, I was just wondering, I, I know we have a beautiful clubhouse here and they hold their meetings here, but I noticed when we parked in the parking lot out here, there's an area in the back here that looks like it's used for shooting, and they talked about trap, and if you're not familiar with what that term means, yes, it would right. be nice if somebody could explain if it's a competition, if they win prizes, or if it's a okay. rifle range, or, or pistol shooting, or whatever. Very good. Good question, Charlie. Thank you. Yeah, i got a young lady here who uh, has been asked uh, a question pertaining to her uh, membership in a club and maybe some trap shooting that she might be doing. Go right ahead, please. My old client. I was in trap shoot for quite a long time. And how many years would that be, Mian? I don't know anymore. <laughs> a long time. Okay, 15, maybe? Oh, more than that. More than that. Well, great. Keep on going, please. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. Okay. And uh, you're a member of this club? I was. Good you was? I was. Just a couple of years ago, I quit. Okay. Okay. And uh, trap shooting, can you explain a little bit about it? Maybe what you had for equipment and uh, as far oh, as... Oh, great. <laughs> Used my husband's gun. Okay. You know what kind it was? 12 gauge. 12 gauge. Great. Right. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and, and can you explain the how trap shooting works? A lot of us here do not know what that's all about. It's volunteered to uh, indicate some information pertaining to the trap shooting and other things, and he'll identify himself. Right ahead, please. Okay. I'm Steve Bing Holsworth. Okay. Um, my wife Cheryl and I, we actually run the trap end of the fishing game. Okay. We've been doing it for probably 10 years. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop you for a minute right there. Can you explain trap shooting to start off with? Absolutely. Um, if anybody's familiar with target shooting, where you would have a, a, a target, okay. it's disc shaped, small, okay. made of clay, and they have a machine that will throw the target out and you attempt to break it using a 12 gauge shotgun okay. and, and like number eight or seven and a half shot that's a little more technical than most people probably want to know but okay. the goal is to break as many targets out of 25 as you possibly can Okay. and uh, you can compete individually or team wise at our facility we most of our shooting in summer anyhow is team All oriented right. so we'll have five guys shoot at one time okay. as a group okay I'm going to stop you for a moment because I'm a, a novice at this also this uh, mechanism that throws this out, it's called a clay pigeon, is that correct? Or is well, that the right actually, term? It, yeah, the clay pigeon is the target, and the machine that throws it out, it's, it's uh, the machine itself is designed to replace, years ago they used to have hand throwers. Oh, okay. Somebody would actually throw a, a target by hand. Dan Deer is, is bringing me some of the, oh, great. the hand targets, or hand throwers that, you can still buy these. Oh, They're, wonderful. Thank you. These are, I want to say that this one here is probably an antique. Okay. But uh, these are what guys would use in their backyard. And okay. Many years ago, they graduated from, from mechanical hand-thrown targets to a mechanical, um, the device itself is bigger. And, and it's, it's this thing only probably the whole arm would swing back, so you could throw a bird a lot farther than somebody physically could do it with their, yes. with their arm. Okay. But it was still all mechanical. There was no motor involved. There was, uh, we would hire kids to come up here and load and cock the machine. That would require them to pull back a spring-loaded metal arm, put a bird on it, and then there would be a pipe buried underground that would come up to behind the shooters, and you'd have uh, a shooter online who was ready, he'd have his gun up and he's calling for a target, so he'd say pull, and you had somebody standing in the back that would actually pull on a lever. This oh. would release this arm. 
So okay. it, it was labor intense. You'd have to have like three people just to make the thing work. Plus it wasn't random uh, for where the target was going. Everybody would know where the target was going because it would just keep going out straight. Straight out, okay. So, um, well, speed on the bird, on the target. Yeah, 60 miles an hour. Okay. Coming off, off the machine right now. Okay, and again this target. It's a round disc. Do you ever want to say, oh, wonderful, thank well, you. This, this, is, this, is a white, <laughs> this is a white version of what we shoot in summer. These okay. we refer to as beer birds. They're priceless. Okay. If you break a white one, we, <laughs> oh. we, we mix these in with the orange ones. So oh. when, when guys are shooting, uh, if a white one comes out and they break it, they win a free beer oh. or soda. All you right. drink beer. Could you just rotate that around real slow and I can get a, a visual of it on the video camera? But this is actually uh, an all white version. What we shoot up here by and large, they're all orange, blaze orange. All so right. it would be the same as this, but orange. Um, all right. Can you give me a size, a diameter? Well, four inches. Four inches. Okay, and it's hollow inside. Yep, hollow on the back. Okay, can just I hold on to that just a moment. Okay, very good. And this mechanism that you spoke of, it's will sling this disc out on a flat plane or something. Right, right. Like in this device right here, you okay. would just you would. I'm not going to even cock it back, but that you get the idea, right? You get the idea that if you pull this arm back, it, yeah. would, it would pull on the spring. Okay. And when you swing your arm around, this bird would fly out, and then it would release. And what they did was they replaced these with a machine. Okay. And our machine will do the same thing this does, but it's automatic. We can put 600 of these targets inside the machine. Okay. And the carousel on the top that holds these 600 will automatically rotate so every time it needs another bird they call them birds okay it needs another bird it will load it in automatically okay. plus what the machine does down there yes it's a very expensive machine it was over eight thousand dollars when we bought it wow it, it, it is capable of throwing two of these at a time if you set it up correctly okay. or um instead of normal machines will oscillate right and left and you never know where the target's going to come out when you when you call for a bird and you say pull, you're not sure where the machine is. So you could get a bird going to your left, to your right, straight ahead. Okay. With, with the, the new machine we bought, it only it oscillates right and left, and it can be set up to oscillate up and down. Oh my gosh. Oh. So you don't know if a bird is kind of leaving level, like a rabbit running away from you, or if it's going to take off like, like a bird would, like a pheasant flying straight up. So okay. I have a question also on pertaining to the bird. It flies out of this machine on a sort of a flat plane or a flat condition arch. arch and it, it heads out to how many much distance from the shooter? Well it's actually where we where we begin to shoot from first we back the guy up the, the people that shoot are 16 yards from the point of release of okay. the target so Thank it's you. a 16 yard distance then the bird is going out in a pre-described arch that uh, the Amateur Trap Association has guidelines set up in your. Oh. We don't. We don't really. We're not that uh, professional up here. We're a little more laid back, so okay. we don't have people that go out each Thursday night and check the machine and make sure it's following these pre-described parameters. You're supposed to have a bird that's 10 feet up above the level plane of the machine All at, right. at uh, 50 feet and then it's supposed to land and hit the ground at 50 yards. So you're supposed to adjust the spring tension on the machine to try to get this to all happen based on wind conditions, but where we shoot out here is somewhat of a ravine. It would be kind of impossible to have somebody standing on the trees there and you know, okay. and measuring where the bird is landing. So right. we just, we tell the guys the machine is set up the best that it can possibly be and we don't change it. So when you come up here on a Thursday night and it's real windy, it's mm -hmm. gonna be hard and yeah. there's that's There's a lot of laughing going on. <laughs> when, when you think you're, when you think everything's going fine and the bird is just flying beautiful and a big gust of wind comes up and you're ready to pull the trigger and it just <laughs> does one of these. It's going that way or it's going to the left or the Wonderful. right. Wonderful. I love it. <laughs> as far, I have a question, Jerry. Just one moment. Hey, we got a lady who uh, has indicated she's got a question. Go right ahead, please. I want to know what the... Your name, please. Kathy Sixel. I want to know what the material um, is in the clay pigeon. And what happens to it? Does it just 
disappear eventually when it's laying out there. Okay. And um, I suppose one person at a time shoots, otherwise you'd have to have different colors, right? <laughs> How would you know only one person shoots at a time at the clay pigeon? Okay, okay. good enough. Thank you. We got a question pertaining to material perhaps on the um, pigeon uh, or the uh, bird and other things, I guess. I forgot what she was indicating. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the question. Uh, they're made out of uh, a clay, and the clay is, is bound uh, with a pitch. And you can oh. see that they break pretty easy. Wow. And eventually this will return back to earth. These are, the birds that we use are not true uh, biodegradable. They do sell targets that are biodegradable. Oh. The risk you run using those is if you don't use them up in time, just if they get a little moist, they, they, tend, uh -huh. they tend to create problems. Sure, uh, sure. You know, it, it, it's, a, a rel it's a good question. It's a relatively simple process making these things and breaking them is pretty difficult. So, <laughs> <laughs> ask any one of us that shoots trap. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Who picks up the mess? Mother Nature <laughs> cleans up the mess. Okay, okay. Eventually, like you said, it'll deteriorate and go yes. back to the soil. Okay, what was the other question, Kathy? Oh, oh, and she, she asked a question. Do, yes, thank you. She asked a question if, if one shooter shoots at each target at time, at one time. And the way it works is when you have a team, you'll have five, five people, five shooters, okay. standing next to each other. There's, there's actually a, there's a, a pre-described spot that they have to stand in. So there's five stations that they shoot from. And okay. the first shooter will call for his bird and when that bird comes out, he gets a chance to shoot it. He shoots at it, and whoever's marking score will record how he did, if he broke it or missed it. Okay. It goes sequentially as down the line so that each shooter will get to shoot five targets from each station. Okay. So for a total of 25, and at the end of the first five targets from the first stand, then the, whoever's marking score will tell them they need to move. So the shooters will, okay. will pick their guns up and they'll rotate so that you get a chance to shoot at five targets from each of five stands. I see. So okay. then you get a, a well-rounded, uh, I mean, if, if some guys are good at shooting birds that go to the left, well, okay. he's okay. going to end up shooting birds that go to the right eventually because he'll be on the, the fifth okay. stand, which is farthest to the right, and then the birds that are coming out, if they are a hard right bird, they can be quite challenging. I was uh, misleading myself. I thought, well, maybe this is a, a bowling type of thing that you always have an anchor man, the guy that can <laughs> always do the striking, but I guess it's not that way. No, and then they keep track of the team score as a total. So you have a total that if you would shoot perfect, which nobody ever has as long as I've been up here. Uh, Scroggins Jewelers, I think they shot 123 one night. That was the best. It might even have been 124, because I remember, uh, a wow. team did that. The team shot 124 out of 125. So it was incredible, wow. incredible feat. But then what happens league-wise, we shoot as a group. We have, we have 12 teams now. We might be going up to 15 teams on a Thursday night summer league. Uh, they get put in classes. So right now we'll have 12 teams shooting. Uh, the best shooters will be put in class A. Okay. Team-wise, it's all. It's none of it's individual. In, in winter league, it's a different story because then we do all individual stuff. But mm -hmm. in summer. The team that the score they score the highest, and nobody really knows exactly what class you're going to be in because otherwise you could theoretically cheat. If you wanted to win Class B and you were actually a Class A team, you could. They call it sandbagging. Yeah. You shoot poor <laughs> on purpose so that you get put into a lower class. Sure. Sure. But at the end of uh, six weeks, we'll have whoever was keeping track of the score will. He'll come up here and he'll post the scores to that date. Up until that time, nobody really has an exact figure on who shot how good. So we make sure nobody knows what's going on. In the sixth week, then you get put in a class. And at the end of the season, we shoot 16 weeks. Then you'll have, we'll have trophies. We have a, a bust-up party. We give out prizes for whoever would won class A, class B, class C. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of individual trophies. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Very okay, good. Jerry, let's cut now. All right. Well, yeah. Good job. Thank you so much. These are some of the tables and chairs that are at the Fish and Games uh, Lodge here. And it's outstanding as far as the work. They put the engravings on the center of the table, and it's carved right into the tabletop. We're just taking an intermission break, and I thought I'd catch this. Boy, outstanding.
Okay, I've been shown uh, some gun racks that are available to the trap shooters so that their guns are stored properly and are available for them to uh, use when they're heading out to the trap shooting area. Beautiful wood. Whoever is doing this is a very top job. These are some of the fish displays they have around the upper per perimeter on the walls. Man, that's a huge one. Okay, we have a special jacket that the members wear, and it's uh, Cleveland Fish and Game, and it's a jacket that does stand out, indicates where you're from. Well done. Hey, Larry. Okay, this bar has a special original location. Well kept, and we have got it here in the clubhouse. So we'll be talking about that. Okay, this is the entrance into the clubhouse, and they've got the beautiful bar, well kept, and it, it stands out on its own. And this is the overall picture of the facility. And we're having our meeting here instead of at our normal LTC location. And this is at the Cleveland Fish and Game uh, Clubhouse. And we appreciate them uh, being uh, a wonderful host at this point. Okay, this bar apparently came from Nenning's Tavern and we'll have more people give us information about that. And the N apparently does stand for Nenning. And the hosts here of the afternoon are providing all the popcorn we can eat here. And right Marie is enjoying me. it right to the fullest here. <laughs> right in front of me. Marie <laughs> already. She sure did. Yeah. Okay, I got a young lady here, and she's going to let us get started on uh, another portion of the meeting today. Go right ahead, please. Kathy Sixel and we have just taken our intermission, and now uh, Larry Klein and Steve Holdsworth and any other staff member will uh, continue with the uh, history of the Cleveland Fish and Game. Very good. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, I have a gentleman here who's been doing a fine job as far as uh, describing this wonderful club, as far as what they do. But uh, he's got more to offer, so I'll have him introduce himself and continue on. Thank you. Yes, Larry Klein again. I just want to wrap up a few things yet, and it's not going to be completely, but uh, I'm going to be putting a complete booklet together in order. Right now I'm jumping from one end to the other, and uh, I've been putting this together for several months already. So, yes, one thing I want to bring up here is the bar that I've seen here. We've purchased that from Teresa Nenick's Bar. And where was that located? That was located just down the road here, by across from Bondi's Quick Mart, which is not there no more. Her pavilion that was there alongside where the dance hall was, that is out in the historical center out in Manawak County. So her bar is sitting in here. We purchased that and put it in our clubhouse. Can I get a date of maybe when that took place? Approximately 20 years ago. Okay, thank you. And then I want to re revamp on the hike of landing down there. I want to say a thank you to Merlin Hansen who gave a lot of his time, donated his hours with his backhoe crane down there, helping us uh, erect that at no cost at all. He donated everything down there for us. And also I'd like to get a whole uh, compliment. He's deceased now, so is Merlin. Beanie Drow, known as Alvin Drow. He hauled all the concrete down there free and some uh, cement was donated through Vandervaart of Sheboygan. And uh, the Heike Park down there was donated by Bill Rutherford. Okay. And back at that time, uh, Junior Zona actually hauled the railroad ties and the fill, which he donated all 
to the landing down there at Heike Park back in them days when that was progressed. Okay. And the, then the addition, addition on the clubhouse here that you see now in here, this was added on in 2007. The remodeling was done by Everett's Construction, of which he donated quite a bit of his price re reduction to us. Okay. And Steve, known better as Bing Holdsworth, did the electricity, and along with all the other club members, donated their time also to get this club where it is today. Wow. In the parking lot, we have an addition out there of six tenths of an acre, which was just purchased from Jack Schnelly last year in 2008. And as of right now, the new office, the officers in this club, as of the moment right now, is President Jeff Stege, Secretary Larry Van Loo, Treasurer is Dan Deere, and Vice President again Steve Bing Holsworth. I'll conclude as of that for as of right now for the Cleveland Fishing Game. Okay, and you had something from the Nenning, uh, was there a document or something you wanted to read? I have what, uh, as far as the grocery store? Yes, or yes. the bar or something of that type? The Nenning's bar, where, uh, where, this, where the bar came from, Jerry, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I thought you had a document of pertaining to No. The, okay. No, I don't. Oh yeah, now we're talking about the grocery store. I'm now sorry. we're going to a different subject. Okay. Pytel's Grocery Store used to be down in Cleveland, Wisconsin, center, right straight across, and which used to be the firehouse years ago, kitty corner of Wimbler's Tavern, and then there used to be a creamery down there, which was Matthias Dairy. Okay. And at that time, the home is now is 1045 and 1045A West Washington Avenue, okay. Cleveland, Wisconsin. All right. As far as I know, I think Edler was the prior owner to it, of which Herman Siegert bought it for his daughter, who married Mr. Pytel, who turned it into a store until their divorce. And Mr. Siegert took it back and remodeled it into a two apartment home, in which I purchased back in 1968. Okay. And it is now owned by my son, Sean Klein, Sean and Susan Klein. Okay. And at that time, back then, there was a bakery in there, the Seeger's Bakery, there was a doctor's office, and also a dentist. And I, and I have the original Pytel grocery sign yet. Okay. At your residence or someplace? At, at the residence of Sean and Sue Klein. Oh, okay. And as far as the dentist and the doctor, would you happen to know any names there? No, that goes way back. I have no okay. recollection of that. I probably wasn't even on his earth yet. <laughs> that house is over 100 some years old. Really? Okay. Here is a photo we got from Mr. Edler, and that there was a barber shop downstairs years ago. That is it. Yeah. Okay, could you show that photo, please? That is it. Just one oh second, please. Just hold it there for a moment. Okay, thank you. Any other photos? Yep, it, it, this is just part of the front. This okay. is the part of part of the front of the home right okay, here. Okay, very good. All right, and that's on what street? One more time, please. West Washington Avenue, 1045 West Washington Avenue, Cleveland. Okay, good. Thank you. And these are... That is of the two, it was the back of it. And then again on Main Street looking toward the house. Okay. This is the back of the, uh, the home there. Okay. Which is still presently the same yet, except with a uh, big back porch deck on it. Okay. Very good, thank you. Kath, I'm Kathy Sixel, and yes. I think at one time, uh, Marie, can you help me on this? It was Holden Store. It was who's? Holden Store, E O L D E N, and I think that Clarence Whitty's yeah, owned it uh, yeah. two at one time. Yes, you're right. Yeah, they yeah. owned it two at one time. But there was no doctor or dentist office in there. There wasn't it? There wasn't by Wimmers. That was Wimmer, see. Wimmer, see I've got this from John Clinton who was trying to tell me there was a dentist and a doctor. Right. But the dentist, Dennis and Doctor were over in Wimbler's, 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 Wimbler's Tavern. Yeah. Grayson. Also, there was a lawyer over there too, yeah. Alan J. Peake. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then I, I have to re retract that back. That it was, That's a, okay. it was it was Secrets Bakery, yeah. mainly yes. Okay. But it was Edler. In a barber in a barbershop. Edler. Edler. Okay. And then they had a lot of kids. I grew up with the kids. And then Mr. Witty also owned it, in between and and, and Holden later. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was after Edler. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we have a young lady who's been with us for uh, since the year 2000, I believe, and she's added so much. But uh, she may have some other recalls on that particular store that was brought up here. Go right ahead. Marie Pippert. It was George and Judas Edler, and uh, they had uh, um, Ruth and Marjorie, Bernadine, Carol, and Eugene and Arthur Edler. And they had a, a, a grocery store in there, and Mr. Edler was a barber. That was also in, in the building. Okay. All right. And then uh, Holdens were in there, and Clarence Whitties, and Every Saturday right after that, I remember during the Edlers were ready, we, we would go in there and buy those do nice hard rolls from Secrets. From, oh, that, that was really good stuff in those days. Okay. okay. Yeah. Very good. And, uh, and were you very close as far as a neighbor to this store? Or? Yeah, let me see once. Right next to it was uh, Otto Reinemann, and then my dad had the garage right next to it. Okay. And then was the dairy. Matt, Matthias Dairy. Yeah, Matthias okay. Dairy, and then William R. Taples House, and then William R. Taples uh, Hardware Store, and then Dr. Reiner, and then where I was born. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All on, on Washington Street. All on Washington Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Was there um, a feed store or something across the street? That was a, a, just a little to the east. Okay. That was... Um, Oh, Vandal worked there. Felix. Felix, yeah, Felix. Oh, okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. That pinpoints things there. Good, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, I'm looking at some wonderful tables that are in the building here, and that's just outstanding and unique. And this gentleman has something to offer about those tables and identify himself, please. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm uh, Fleet Wagner. The table's behind me when we built onto this new addition last year was donated by uh, Larry Boone. Okay. Lyle, Lyle, I'm sorry, Lyle Hoon. Okay, thank you, who everybody. Has, who has a store in Sheboygan that has tables and hardwood flooring and so okay. on and so forth. Okay. He donated three tables. And wow. It's really nice tables. Is he a member, by the way? He is a member. He shoots trap here and he's a regular member, too. Wow, great. And I noticed there's some very beautiful carvings on the top of the table, all different scenes. You, can you indicate something there, please? Well, I guess uh, one is a couple of pheasants flying around. Some are one another tables, a couple of a deer or so. Okay. And the third one, I think there's fish on top. Okay. So it is all different nature scenes. And who did that? I. It came from Lyle Holmes. It came so from that way from Whoever his... did it, I have no idea. Okay, so it came from his store. That's correct. Oh my goodness, great. Hey, that's... And it's a nice donation to the cult. It sure is. It, it sets it off very nicely, I gotta say. And you have some other trophies of different uh, assortment of sports fish, I guess, and so yes, forth. Yes, there's a... You can pan up a little higher. There's a yeah. fish over here, or a couple fish. This bigger one on the south wall here. Actually, it came from our from Lake Michigan from one of our members. Not quite sure who it was. Dave Barnes. Dave Barnes. That's correct. Okay, good. Thank we you. had. A, uh, I don't know what year our fishing derby was, but that was the big fish that was caught at the derby. And what kind of fish was that? A, is that a salmon? That's or something? a big coho, right? Oh, okay. yeah, king, not a coho, king, king, king salmon. I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, uh, the other fish, I yes, have sir. no idea where that came from. I caught it. Bing Holes were you caught. got it. Oh, okay. Oh, let's let's hear just a, nice a quick story. story about how did it happen to be. <laughs> oh, I hate telling the story. Uh, I got invited to Canada with a friend. Uh, I had a brother living up there, and he asked if I wanted to go along and fish in a a contest. A contest. I, yeah, it was a, it was a contest where you could win a a full size Ford pickup truck with a boat motor trailer behind it. So it was a, it was a pretty big deal and I said well I'm game you know so he called and he, he, he lined it all up we were supposed to leave and uh, three days before we were going to go up there they canceled the fishing contest because we had warm weather up there and there wasn't enough ice on the lake where they actually get uh, a thousand fishermen to participate they charge everybody uh, twenty dollars a ticket but they park them all real close they, they run their fishing contest a little different up there so they park them pretty close in one area that's 
on a lake, and then they, they run it on time basis so that when you start fishing, you have two hours. Whoever gets the biggest fish wins this okay. truck and thing. Okay. So I was kind of disappointed that we didn't get to go fish in that contest. But uh, uh, the guy's brother who lived up there said, well, we'll take you up. Maybe we can catch a big northern for you. So he took us. He took us north. He lived near Thunder Bay. He was about 45 minutes okay. from Thunder Bay, Ontario. And he took us about an hour north of Thunder Bay. And I had no idea what it was in for. It was 10 degrees below zero. And he <laughs> said, well, we're going to go into a lake that you can't get to by vehicle. So he, I didn't know what to expect. Like I said, so he's like, well, you're going to have to ride in the trapping sled behind the four-wheeler. I said, well, that's no problem. And he said, well, it's about seven miles off the road. So you can imagine me riding in a, in a, in a this plastic sled for seven miles behind a four-wheeler going down logging trails through Canada. By the time we got to the lake, it was 10 below zero. All this snow that was flying up was melting on my glasses. They nicknamed me the Iceman because I, I couldn't even open my eyes. I was just coated over. So they put me in a corner on an island where the sun could get on my face so that I could at least try to get some of the ice off. And uh, when we started fishing, I was I was wound up. I was putzing with everybody's tip-ups, and I was getting yelled at a lot. But it seemed like every time I would check the bait, I'd put it back down, and a fish would bite. So I was catching a lot of fish and getting yelled at for getting fish out of turn. <laughs> and then that thing up on the wall yes. decided to grab on. And I had no idea what I was in for. It just it felt really big, but it didn't, it didn't seem like that big. Yeah. And I got it up, and I tried to get it in the hole to get its head in the hole to pull it through. And yeah. it, it, the Water was crystal clear and I could look down, the ice was about two and a half to three foot thick. And I could see, it just looked green in the bottom of the hole. And I was wondering where my fish was. I was trying to get the head in there. And then it dawned on me, I was looking at the fish's head. It took up the hole. So I had to stick my arm down and, and I had to try to slide the fish's nose back to where I could get it to turn and come up the hole. And meanwhile, the guys are on the island and they're yelling at me. They call me all kinds of names because I'm futzing around with oh. baits again. Yeah. And uh, just about that time, I got the fish's head turned to where I could get my hand underneath his snout. And I mean, I was so excited. I forgot all about the teeth in there. Yeah. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. I, I caught it underneath its, the gill where you yeah. can turn it around. And I slid it up over the top. And I was kneeling on the ice. And I slid it up over the top of me. And it was 42 inches long. So it came right over my shoulder. And it oh. flopped down. And all I heard was some expletives back on the island. <laughs> and the four-wheelers start up, and these guys come running out there. And the guy that lived in Canada said, well, you got to enter that in this local fish contest. I said, well, I thought they canceled it. He says, no, this is just a little, it's a local contest. You pay per fish to enter this contest. So I did. cost $2.50 to enter it. It's the proudest moment of my life. There's tables like this, you know, and it's filled. There's 50 or 60 Canadian fishermen. This American came in, and when I pulled that fish out of the bag, all you heard was chairs. Everybody had a back. Everybody stood up. <laughs> and I said, you weren't kidding. There really is a big one. I thought there were a dime a dozen up there. He says, no. He says, you got a trophy. He says, you oh, got to put it on the wall. So I put it on the wall. And, and the breed or the... Uh, it's a northern pike. Northern pike. It weighs 21 and a half pounds, Jeez. and it's 42 and a half inches long. Wow. And it was hanging at my house up in, I call it, the gun room. It's where I reload shells for shooting trap and things, and nobody ever got to see it. And when we put the addition on, I asked Jeff Stege, who's the president, I said, you wouldn't happen to want a big fish up on the wall, would you? And he said, oh, oh, yeah. Did. did you win the truck? I did. Well, see, they, they canceled it. I did win quite a few prizes <coughs> for the fish, but there was nothing big. It was all just little odds and ends. And I was so happy to get it, I really didn't want him. I told the guy that lived in Canada, why don't you keep the prizes? He got me a really good deal on having it uh, mounted. Wow, wow, wow. Now, there is teeth in that fish's mouth. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and look, looking back, that was probably... Show me your hand, show me your there. hand. There, all the fingers are there, yeah. That was probably one of my uh, dumber decisions to do, but I'm really glad I did it. Wow. What an, uh, what an exciting episode that oh, was. it was. It was. And, and we caught quite a few fish that day, but there was nothing that even approached that. The rest of the northerns we probably caught were 20, 25 to 28 inches long. Yeah. Well, congratulations on a job well done. And Thank I'm you. I'm sure the club here really appreciates that thing because it does grab your eyes right away. Right. And we are looking for more. We okay. are actually asking for a couple more big fish so, you know. Okay. We get some members to go out there and when they catch something big and they're willing to donate the fish because it is quite an expense you yeah. know, to have oh, a fish yeah. mounted like mounted. that. Uh, do you know the gentleman's name that mounted for you by chance? Nope. Oh yeah, Bill Zetchi. 
Say it again, please. Bill Zetchi. Okay. Wonderful job. You can be proud. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. And Thank it was you. delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Okay, got a gentleman here who'd like to speak a little bit. Go right ahead. Clink Wagner. Thank you. I mentioned before about the gentleman, Lyle that donated the uh, tables and chairs. Yes, sir. He also donated the whole new flooring in here, plus in the bathrooms, the flooring also, I, I believe so. Oh, my goodness. Well, you can be very proud of this facility. I, I didn't have this idea at all when I first came upon the premises here. Yeah, so. you, you really don't see it from the road, from Double X, because no. there's no. so many trees around here. But right. People that come up here are really, they, they turn their eyes when you come and okay. look inside. I'm going to come along with one more question in regard to, again, trap shooting. Trap shooting is a, is a little bit of a noisier type sport. Any complaints from anybody on that particular problem? Not really. Um, okay. Everybody knows that Thursday nights, <laughs> there's trap shooting for from 6 o'clock maybe till 9.30, 10 o'clock. Okay. Get that late. Yeah. And there really hasn't any complaints that I know of. Okay. Apparently when you say that late, there must be lighting available? Oh yes, we do have lights right up on our trap range. Okay. There's a, it illuminates the whole area. All right. <laughs> Actually, when it's half dark and half light yet, it's hard to see the birds. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. once it gets totally dark, it's like daylight. Yeah, I bet that really brings them out. Oh, yes. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we've got a gentleman here who is an avid trap shooter, I believe, and he'd like to add a bit of information and identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Okay, I'm Steve. Steve Holsworth, and I just wanted to relay some information as to neighbors complaining about noise okay. when we shoot. Thank you. Um, the best thing you can do is invite the neighbors to join. So we did, and, <laughs> and we got uh, the Dines live across the street, sure. and Phil Dine just built the house last year, and okay. he, he's a member, and he shoots trap. So he Wonderful. joined the league, and we have a gentleman who owns the schoolhouse next door, it's Arts of Whiffle, yeah. and we're friends with him. Uh, I actually you know, bring him some beers occasionally. Okay. He, you know, he knows he's welcome. He can walk right through his backyard and come in here on Thursday night. Okay. Um, the gentleman next door, he used to shoot trap up here years ago. Uh, I forget his name right now, but he's lived here forever. Um, and then down at the end of the road, we have uh, Warren Wyant, who is a, he's a gun dealer. So he actually, he will shoot guns. He's got a pile of dirt. It's a safe range. And when he works on guns, he shoots some so okay. we're in a good location for shooting, very little. I've never heard, any, in fact, I've never heard any complaints good. about shooting. Good. Well, that's a wonderful thing, and you're doing it right by inviting the, the enemy, if you will, but uh, right. it brings back a, you know, a good result. Really. Right, and it's not as noisy as you think because of the trees. We're, we're, oh. in, we're in a bit, of a, a bit of a hollow in the woods, so okay. to speak, so the, the, the noise doesn't travel so much from here. Although I do hear people in the village of Cleveland will hear it off in the distance and they just think it's interesting. They have to explain it sometimes when people stop over on a Thursday night and they'll ask what that is. They what said, is oh, that? they got a trap range out west of town. I can hear it. Jerry, I want got a young lady with a question, please. Uh, Kathy Six and Larry, when you talked about the harbor facility down there, didn't they intend to develop that for yachts and things at one time? Yes. Just one moment. Okay, we got a question from the floor from uh, Kathy Sexel in regard to the uh, pier, I believe, and the. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll let you go with it. Thank you. Yes, that, that Hike Park. Your name, please. Larry Klein. Thank Hike you. Hike Park down there. There was twice trying to get development down there to put a har safe harbor down there, and I talked to John Collector the other day. He said years ago the creek used to be a safe landing, which it was not kept up. And then they tried to promote it from that point on, which was the Cleveland Outboard Club was promoted through with John Kleckner. John Tuzzi was the big one from Illinois up here, who a, has a uh, home on the lake down here. And he was trying to promote it. And then he got involved. It didn't go through it. And John Kirsch got into it, who worked for, which is called Rust now, engineering. And he got involved with it and really tried to head the project on too. And uh, I was working with them. We all were working with them on it and trying to promote this as a safe harbor. And back then when John Tuzzi was in there, we did have appropriation for 
about a 75 foot pier out there, but then we got stopped by the DNR and the Corps of Engineers got involved in it. And the permits were not taken out on time. Evidently, it did not meet the deadline. And down the road right now, yes, maybe there might be something in the future yet because we are recognized now here as a landing at Haika down there right now, which is on the map. Mm -hmm. In case there is rough weather out there, they have a place that is on their GPS that says, yes, there's a landing down here now. So okay. maybe down the road something might progress on that, but <coughs> as of now, no. Okay. All right. And years ago, yeah, that used to be the main shipping docks years ago at Haika down there, which they used to bring the boats in with their horses and pulleys and then unload the boats and bring that here and take it up to Green Bay and to Milwaukee. This was the main harbor wow. many, many years ago, yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we've got a gentleman who raised his hand and identify himself, please. John Wiegan, <clears throat> I just would like to mention that uh, we do the clipping and trimming up here and have done so for the past oh. 19 years. Oh. We, really? enjoy, we enjoy doing that. Oh, well, I didn't know that, John. Thank and you. they do a great job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is your family that does yeah. this? Yeah. Okay. Super. Very good. Thank you. Do you belong to this, by the way? No, actually, I don't. Okay. <laughs> well, this is out of your uh, gratis uh, condition also, then. Well, they do pay us. They do pay us. Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, John. Got a young lady who raised her hand. She just got a, maybe a question or some answers. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Edith, let's see. And uh, the, the boats came from New York. My, my husband's folks came across there, and Grandma Litzy would not get back on. They wanted to go to Milwaukee, and she would not get on the boat again. She says, I'm staying in Cleveland. <laughs> So that's what happened. They came here as a safe harbor with the piers, and they stayed, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I've got a young lady here who has been with us for many, many years, and uh, she made all the arrangements for our meeting today, I guess, and it turned out well, but uh, we'd like to sign off. Go right ahead. I'm Kathy Sixel, and I'm in behalf of the Greater Centerville Historians. On March 8th, 2009, sure. I would like to thank all the members of the Cleveland Fish and Game for the nice job they did and for especially letting us meet on site. That was really nice. That, that is nice. Now we know what this is all about. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Gabby. And who do you have here, please? Charlie Bauer from Newton. Thank you. Uh, Frederick Jacoby, Manitowoc. Thank you. John Wiegan, Town of Centerville. Thank you, John. And I'll pass over here. Earl Ziegler, Cleveland. Thank you. Marie Pepper, Cleveland, but Thank I you. have something else to say. Yes. Um, I got two of the Bluebird houses that they made. Larry Vanlo brought them over to me. But I swear he closed those holes because I haven't had a bird in that <laughs> since. And then they're still on the property. I still haven't gotten any. <laughs> Thank you for trying. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And we have here, please? Edith Lutzer, Cleveland. Thank you, Edith. And who do we have here, please? Steve Holsworth, Cleveland. Thank you. And you were holding something there, and maybe, it, maybe a word on that just before we... Well, start. they wanted a brief explanation on what was the story behind the trophy, and this is just similar to what we would award to someone who shoots summer league trap here if they were a member of a team that won... Uh, their division, their class, okay. and this would be like an individual trophy for a team member. Wow, and that's a position that they would take as far as shooting too, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, well that's wonderful. And you, ma'am? Cheryl Holsworth, Cleveland. Thank you, appreciate it. Larry Klein, Cleveland Town of Centerville, <laughs> Cleveland Fishing Game member. Thank you, good job today for both of you gentlemen. Thank you. And what do you have here, please? Cleet Wagner, Cleveland. Thank you, Cleet, for allowing me to have more information. That was very good and valuable. And who do you have here, please? I own Clyde from Town of Centerville. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Kay Shell, Glen Beulah. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Shell, Glen Beulah. Okay, thank you. And who do you have the gentleman back there? Jeff Stegge, current president of Fishing Game. Okay. Glad to have you aboard, sir. Thank you for coming. And I guess we have one more thing from this young lady and myself, Jerry O'Neill, the videographer, would like to thank all the people that came today. And uh, the weather wasn't the greatest, but it was wonderful and we appreciate it. Right ahead, please. Kathy Sixel, and our next week, uh, meeting will be, you know, the second Monday in April and is go going to be by Soaring Eagle Farms. Yeah, Soaring Eagle Farms. And uh, that is the Fitzgeralds. 
That's one of the Fitzgerald farms. One of them. Yeah. One of the Fitzgerald farms, and it will be in the Cleveland room this time. The Cleveland room at LTC. At LTC. Oh, okay. And again, the Soaring Eagle Dairy Farm. Yes. Okay. And again, thank you, everyone. It was a great Sunday afternoon. <laughs>